Chances are, if you're listening to this podcast, you're interested in becoming a homeowner. In fact, 65% of Americans choose at some point in their life to become homeowners. So why is there so much out there with regards to headlines about not buying a house, about waiting, about you know buying at the perfect time, trying to pick the top, pick the bottom, whatever, you know the risk, if you will. So in today's episode, Josh and I are going to talk about the risk of not only buying a home, but the risk of not buying a home. The things that you have to ask yourself, the questions that you need to ask yourself as a potential buyer out there looking to buy in this market. Josh, you and I both have our biases. I'm a real estate professional. You're a mortgage professional. So when people hear that, they automatically think these guys are pushing home ownership so that they can line their pockets, so that they can benefit directly. When in all reality, we only benefit from the people who work with us, but you and I have both benefited from home ownership in, in you know, creating you know, some part of generational wealth. And that's really the backbone of today's conversation. So Josh, let's start really simple converse, you know, really simple starting point here and say, who should own a home? So you hinted at something very important. At any given time over the last 80 years, about 65% of American households choose to be homeowners. So two thirds, two out of three. And there's some important numbers there that we talk about. Homeowners have 40 times greater net worth, a little more than 40 times greater net worth than renters. So let's put it in actual real terms. $255,000 uh, median net worth for homeowners, $6,300 median net worth for renters. So you can see two out of three families choose, hope, aspire, and become homeowners. And the long-term result for them is 40 times greater net worth. Now it's a unique form of net worth. It's not money sitting in the bank. It's not money in stocks. It's not money in crypto that you can cash in and go buy a car or pay for a trip to the emergency room, but it is still very much wealth. And the most important thing we get a lot of times people say, well, you're just cherry picking because homeowners tend to be older. Older people are wealthier. Homeowners tend to be more educated. More educated people tend to be wealthier. Um, any number of things there. So 100% correlation does not equal causation. But when we come back to it, 65% of homeowners' net worth is in home equity. So there is a very high correlation, enough that we can say it is causing you to become more wealthy. So we can go through all the intangible reasons why people want to become homeowners, a place of your own, your own nest, somewhere to raise your family, somewhere that you want to put a wood shop in the backyard, a she shed, whatever you want to do, it is yours. You own it, you have your own piece of the world, and you get to do it. So I don't really think at this point there's even a debate, Jeb, at any given time, two thirds of people, given their, their druthers, would choose to be homeowners. So today, what we're talking about is, how do you decide if now is right for you based off of what are the potential risks of, of not buying now? What are the potential rewards of buying later? Because what we get a lot, Jeb, is someone saying, hey, I'm waiting until these prices come down. And you go, okay, well, one of the things that I repeatedly mention on this show, on the live show is, if you think something is going to happen, what you really owe to yourself is to think all the way through and say, what has to be true for the outcome that I believe is going to happen? And what would have to be true for me to be wrong? So a lot of what we're gonna go through today, Jeb, is exactly that. We don't, we don't have the answer, right? Neither you don't have a crystal ball, I don't have a crystal ball. We have some data that tells us where we think the puck is going, but we don't know exactly where it's going. Well, well, part of the problem, Josh, is that at the moment, there's so many forms of media out there. Anybody that has an opinion can put an opinion out there on multiple platforms. And in fact, it can make its way around the world quicker than you and I can can have a you know a quick conversation here. So, you know, as much as people believe the idea that home ownership is important and that it provides stability and that it does all of these things for their family, on the flip side, they've got people in their ear, right? Family members, friends talking about how they bought at the last top, how they did this or that. And that stuff, you know, as much as it, you don't want it to matter, it does matter, right? Because it's it's negative, uh, you know, feedback in 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 the loop, if you will, and and that stuff can can end up having an impact here. And so, Josh, said, you said something important that you've got. If you think something is true or want something to be true then you've got to go back and ask yourself all of the questions of how. How does that become true? 
And if these things that I'm thinking, you know, are going to happen, don't happen, then what is the effect of that? And, and so that's really the conversation, like you said, Josh. So when is the right time in your life? Because some people buy homes as soon as they graduate college. They're 18, 19, 20 years old. They're in, you know, um, coming out of college. They've got good paying jobs. They decide at that point, home ownership is right for them. And then you've got people that are 35, 40, 45, 50, 55 years old. I mean, I just went up basically the entire uh, age bracket there, but people choose to buy homes at different points in their lives and for different reasons. So when is the right time? And Jeb, not to take you off track of your thought, but I don't know if you saw the data the other day, um, but some numbers came out that says Gen Z has the highest home ownership rate at age 25 of like any of the last five generations. And if you go back to the housing bust, that happened right in the middle uh, of millennials coming of age. Am, right am I Gen Z? The, um, no, Gen Z is after millennial. You're Gen uh -huh. X. Oh, I'm, no, I Gen, don't know. I, I get so lost in the uh, in the you're, alphabet. You're right. You're right there on the border. You were uh, <laughs> tail end of Gen X, front end of millennials. But millennials were like, remember, they were going to live in their parents' basement, never going to own a home. Home ownership is awful. And yet we got to Gen Z, which had some tailwinds of really low interest rates. Um, and and I still say that's difficult. Like for me in Southern California in a high priced area. I don't see hardly any Gen Z buyers. We'll get one 25 year old a year total. Um, so it's not common, but the numbers don't lie. Nationwide, they have the highest home ownership rate at age 25 of any of the last four or five generations. So this hasn't changed over time. There's something inherent in us as Americans that we want to do that. And as you said, some people are doing it at, at very early ages. There are some headwinds, it's getting more difficult, but that stability, it really is not a question of, should you buy a home? Do you want to buy a home? Most people should, most people want to. The question comes back to when is it right? And we hammer this regularly. It's that stability in your life. You have a point in your job and your career because income is a huge component of being able to qualify and being comfortable in making that payment. So when we say job and career, Jeb, talk a lot about you know being in one location. Some people to, to be upwardly mobile with their company or in their industry, say, I go take a job in Portland. Hey, I'm getting moved to Fort Lauderdale. You have to have that flexibility when you're young. When you're young, most people are not settled in their relationship. They haven't found their significant other, whether they're getting married, not getting married, having kids, not having kids. Much of that hasn't been decided. And as you point out all the time, Jeb, costs of transaction costs of getting into and out of real estate is high. You don't want to jump into it willy nilly. You don't want to get on the wrong side of it. You don't want to have a short window. So that stability of job and career, stability of family, stability of your finances, have a, having achieved a, a credit score that allows you to get good terms and some savings that allows you to put some money down, possibly cover your own closing costs. Those, those are the things that I like all of my buyers to have achieved. And most people that are calling and reaching out, I'm sure the same with you, Jeb, if someone's asking or saying, I would like to get pre-qualified or I would like to go out and look at homes, they, they generally tick those boxes because you in your head wouldn't be comfortable with the thought of buying a home if you haven't reached those levels. No, and, and there's three things that I always tend to focus on when I'm telling people to buy homes. And it's, you know, having money in the bank, you know, being comfortable with that monthly payment, regardless of what that is, rates high, rates low, doesn't matter what the rates are. Are you comfortable with the monthly payment? If something happens, are you able to continue making that payment? Are you buying that home with the intent that interest rates are going to come down and then you're going to be able to afford it? Or are you buying it with the intent that, hey, doesn't matter what happens. I've got a fixed payment here. I'm going to be good. And the last thing I always like to think about when talking about the stability piece is time. Now, having time on your side. Now, this is something you can't control 100% of, but if you're at that point in your career, uh, in your relationship where you're traveling, where you're doing things, you're not sure where you want to settle down, where your job is going to take you, you know, you know, if you're going to be with your, your, you know, partner's family in, in Florida, or if you're going to be with your, your partner's family in Montana or whatever it is, then maybe buying right now isn't the right move because of some of the things that we're going to talk about in today's video. You know, we've seen historical appreciation on single family homes or in real estate in general average about 4.6% over the last 60 years. 
Here in the state of California, it's actually higher. It's closer to 6 7% on average, uh, that appreciation. But when you see two, three years of rapid appreciation, like we've seen over the last couple of years, right? We saw 35, 40% appreciation in a two to three year period, which would normally take a decade to get, then there's a chance that you see prices move sideways. Prices move down slightly in some areas. In some areas, you might see prices continue to climb because of some of the other factors that we're going to talk about. So, but but having time on your on your side, something we talk about all the time, Josh, is real estate is a get rich slow scheme. Doesn't happen overnight. And the expectation that it should happen overnight, in my opinion, is looking at real estate the long way. So if you have all of the things that Josh talked about, you have the things that I talked about you have time on your side, then I feel like you have that stability, which is going to take you to essentially making the decision of whether or not at that point, you know, is buying a house right now the right thing for me? So Josh, I think it's important to start. Let's talk about the risk of not buying a house right now, right? Counterintuitive, but what's the risk of not buying today? So we talk a lot about affordability in terms of what happens with trajectory of prices going forward. Um, if there's not a volume of people, able demand, so not just people willing to buy a home, but able to buy a home because of low affordability, it's hard for prices to move upward. Um, but when we have limited supply, a supply demand imbalance, there are not enough homes for people to buy. We've seen homes continue to go up, even though affordability is at or near record lows. So the risk of not buying is affordability could get worse. Maybe this is the new normal. Maybe going forward, interest rates are, are six and a half and people adjust to that and home prices just continue to go up. So you don't have an improvement in interest rates further down the line that you're waiting for. You don't have a decrease in home prices and therefore your entry point becomes worse. You're having to either allocate a greater percentage of your income to the same home or you're having to look at lower priced homes. Maybe you go from a single family to a condo. Maybe you go from a 2000 square foot house to a 1500 square foot house. But those are the things that you may end up looking at in terms of all of your thoughts in terms of, of moving forward. Does this get more affordable? Does it get less affordable? We have a lot of people out there, Jeb, who are, are imagining, hey, affordability is an all-time low. It has to get better, but it doesn't necessarily have to get better. It could indeed get worse. No. And, and, and you know, we talk again a lot about willing and able demand. Everybody in, in, in my eyes is willing to own a home right? They, everybody wants to own a home, whether or not they say they do. The reality is everybody wants to become a homeowner, right? For one reason or another. So we have a lot of demand out there. So depending on what happens with, with inventory, what happens with interest rates, you could see the potential for increased competition uh, because millennials are still turning prime buying age and you still have a population that is what's after millennials, um, the next generation that's coming into that prime buying age as well. The numbers are Gen Z. The numbers are really, really high over the next couple of years of people continuing to turn prime buying age, which means, you know, even if demand essentially stayed the same to some extent, You've got to have changes in other things like inventory and yeah, I mean, I'm um, uh, yeah, inventory in order to to make buying a home, uh, I guess, less of uh, less competitive out there. So by waiting, there's a chance that people continue to say, you know what, I'm not waiting. I'm going to do this, and they eat up the supply. And because we know that ninety percent of Americans have an interest rate below 5%, there's a lot of people locked into property that for whatever reason are not going to sell that home unless you see interest rates much lower. So if things stayed the same, Josh, like they are presently today, increased competition would be another risk for, for not buying a home in today's market. Jeb, a really important point on that competition front. Almost everyone has heard the very valid point that from 2020 to 24, Millennials were coming into prime home buying age. If we look at, we go baby boom, baby boomers to Gen X to millennials. Gen Xers were essentially a baby bust. So the that generation was much smaller 
than baby boomers. So we overbuilt during that period of 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007, at the same time that the prime demographic cohort coming of age, uh, home buying age was much smaller than the one previously. Well, now since then we've underbuilt and we had this big generation of millennials coming into the market, but there's no bust behind them. If you look at the chart, there were a couple of really baby boom years of millennials where, where there are more of them born that year but we go out all the way through Gen Z, there was never a bust. So there's no smaller generation coming behind them where you're gonna have less 32, 33, 34 year olds to battle against if you're looking at buying your first home. So we had this wave of increased buying demand, but that wave is not really gonna wane. It's gonna stay level for the next 10, 15, 20 years. I don't know what the generation is beyond Gen Z and what um, their parents were doing and how many of them there are going to be. We've talked about population growth, still growing in the United States, but not growing as fast uh, as it has. Very small, positive population growth. But uh, in terms of generations going forward, if you're looking at buying a home in the next five, 10, 15 years, there is no relief from a smaller cohort, uh, demographic cohort coming of home buying age. That demand is going to be there. We have not kept pace in terms of building of what needs to be built. That's worse in some parts of the country, especially where we are here in, in densely populated Southern California, Bay Area, other parts of the country, Texas, where they can build more, not as big of an issue. So you have to look regionally how big of an issue that is for you. But we're, we're not necessarily looking at having any less uh, people to, to fight against uh, in terms of competition to buy or any more supply to choose from. So if we look at it, we really don't have uh, much of a recipe for a better, more affordable entry point going forward. Well, Josh, let me ask you this question. So what about the people that say we're in a recession right now? There's a lot of people out there, really l smart people that believe we're already in a recession and that you know the Fed, the, the government essentially hasn't admitted to the fact that we're in a recession yet, that, you know, they're usually a year off, if you will. But regardless, we're in a recession, we're headed into a rece recession, we've got slower economic growth. What do you say to the people that say that is on the horizon, therefore, I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to wait for that to play out because that's a risk if I buy a house now. So an interesting concept, Jeb, I listened to an interview this weekend with David Rosenberg, really smart guy, and he pointed out, there's two camps right now. We're going to have a soft landing or we're in or heading into a recession. He goes, what's the difference? He says, in a soft landing, your bonus gets cut. He says, in a recession, your pay actually gets cut. So there's actually a secondary piece to that beyond just your pay getting cut. If you're able to keep your job, you actually have unemployment going higher. But unemployment generally increases the most at the lower end of the pay scale. Those aren't so much the people that are buying and selling homes. So uh, do I think a recession is gonna have a huge impact in, in housing? I don't, I do think we're gonna have a recession. I don't think it's gonna be tremendously bad. Um, and I don't think it's gonna have a huge impact on housing, but what it does, we, we talk about, do we have a recipe for upwards pressure on home prices? I don't really see it. Affordability is low, home prices are high, rates are high. Even if they improve, they're still gonna be high relative to what people have come to expect over the last 12, 15 years. Um, and we then have employment and wage pressures in a negative way. So it tells us there's not a huge recipe for home price appreciation going forward. That being said, this is completely anecdotal. I have a client here in Southern California. They found a home they loved last week for $759,000. Uh, before they could get their offer in, there were already 10 offers and the highest one at $815,000. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about, was that home price too low to begin with? Yep. Is that a unique price range in a unique area? Um, long way of saying, we anecdotally, Jeb, get lots of comments on the YouTube channel, lots of comments on the live show. People saying, this, no one can afford homes. This can't go on. And yet I have a guy qualified to buy that home. There were eight other people qualified to buy that home and push it higher. So long way of saying, I don't think your typical home buyer is the person who's going to be impacted by a recession. Um, we have a, a different demographic situation um, with many of the boomers retiring. The workforce of skilled labor, 
the people who make good wages and buy homes is smaller. So when we're coming off of three and a half percent unemployment rate, if it doubles and goes to 7%, we're still a full 50% better than we were in 2008. So would a recession impact housing? Yes. Is it going to cause home prices to come down? I don't think so. It will prevent home prices from going up would be the most likely outcome. And again, that is my educated expert opinion from 27 years of doing this and reading really smart people. But there's no guarantee that that's how it plays out. Well, I mean, I have several stories myself as a real estate agent putting in a bunch of offers. I'm coming up short almost every week and it's almost embarrassing, right? As a real estate agent, I want to tell you, I get every deal accepted. I write the best terms, the best contracts. People can't resist my offers. No, that's not happening. We're writing really strong offers. There are just people out there with cash willing to pay more, do things that my clients aren't willing to do to get property. A story from yesterday. Purchase price around a million dollars. We came in at a million 180. That's essentially the top end of my client's budget. They could qualify for more home. They ch they're choosing not to. That's where they're comfortable with the payment, a million 180. At the time, the conversation yesterday, emailed the, the agent and he said, you wrote a really strong offer. You should get a counter offer. About four hours later, his wife called me and said, we've got three. At the moment, you're not getting a counter. We're only countering the top three offers. And all three of those offers are over a million 250. That's $70,000 higher than we were and $250,000 higher than the original asking price. And you're saying, yeah, it could be underpriced. Yeah, yeah, all of those things could be true. But the reality is there's at least three people willing to go $250,000 above the asking price. Just craziness out there in the market. And Josh, you said something important that I want to, to make people aware of. We're not here trying to tell you the direction of the housing market. I think that's important to know, right? As much as it comes off as, hey, we know this, this is what Josh and I believe to be true, doesn't necessarily make it true, right? Like, like I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, we have our biases. Josh has been doing this 27 years. I've been doing it nearly 20 years. So combined, there's a lot of experience here in dealing with sellers, dealing with buyers, dealing with multiple types of markets, talking to multiple agents across the United States, talking to multiple lenders across the United States, gathering that information and trying to package it in a way that we feel like is beneficial to becoming the educated home buyer so that you can ask the right questions in your life if it's the right time for you. So that said, Josh, what are the risks of buying, uh, of waiting to buy a house? We've talked about the risk of not waiting. What's the risk of waiting? Well, I wanted to throw this in before we move on to that, and, and it will help us as we continue the discussion of, of the potential re rewards for you to, to wait. Um, everything we're talking about here, uh, everything that we look at, everything that we analyze, think in terms of conditional logic, if then. I don't know the preceding condition. I don't know what is going to happen with interest rates. We have an opinion and, and we look and study and research that, but no one knows. But what we can do is sit back and say, if rates go higher, here's what's likely to happen. If rates go lower, here's what's likely to happen. If builders build more, here's what's likely to happen. So everything we're looking at is in that if then situation. So with that, what could be the possible benefits to you of waiting. The big one, Jeb, is affordability improving. Affordability, the big things, so there's three components to affordability, home prices, interest rates, and wages. Mm -hmm. Wages, we don't have a lot of control over. They have generally a steady uh, upwards trend of three to 5% annually. Some years, they'll be a little less. Some years, they'll be a little bit more, but they kind of track home prices over time. They track inflation over time. So really the things that could move in the short run are home prices or interest rates. So let's start with home prices, Jeb, because if I had a dollar for every time someone told me, generally online, not really in a phone call or in person, I'm waiting for home prices to drop 20% and then I'm going to come back so into I. the market. I, Jeb is too. Jeb, <laughs> Jeb has been trying to find- I'm your uh, competition. If home yeah. prices drop 20%, guess who else is your competition? The other- 300 million Americans out there looking to buy homes. No, in all reality, yes. I mean, what's the likelihood of prices? What do you need? We, we said this earlier. What are the questions you have to ask yourself in order for prices to drop? Josh, I'm asking that question to you. What has to happen in order to see lower house prices? 
interest rates would have to go higher and remain elevated. So as we record this, we're about six and a half in the last 12 months. The best we've seen interest rates was about 5%. The worst was about 7.1%. Um, but in the last six, seven, eight months, the best they've been is about 6%. So six to 7% is this new range. If we were in that seven to 8% and we stayed there for two, three years, home prices are going to come down. They won't come down 20%, but is 10%, 12%, is something like that uh, realistic? And are there areas that are escalated or elevated higher than that that could see 200? Yes, some areas could. But on a nationwide basis, a long extended one to two year time frame of seven to eight percent interest rates would bring prices down. So what would have to happen to, to make that be the case? We would have to have continued high inflation where investors require that type of return to tie up their money in 30-year mortgages. Um, that's a different show. We've done it a million times. If you want to hear more on it, show up on the live show. We put inflation data up uh, every week. I was just looking at a chart here that basically shows other than core services inflation, we are exactly back to where we were in 2019. The biggest component of core services inflation that remains high is the housing component. Mm -hmm. So they have a couple of different measures in there and they're due to the base year effects, it's going to be coming down over the next few months. So I believe inflation is moderated. As inflation moderates, the spreads between treasuries and mortgages will decrease. So do we have a recipe for 3% interest rates again? No, we don't. But we have a recipe for rates significantly lower than the six and a half that they're at right now. But you just said something uh, that is... Um... What's what's the what's the word? Um, an oxymoron, uh, I believe, is is the right word. I might be wrong with that. Uh, but you said housing affordability would improve with house prices dropping because interest rates are higher. That that wouldn't necessarily be true because if interest rates go up, even if prices come down, chances are housing affordability doesn't really improve in that scenario. Is that right? Uh, no. You're is, right, well, more, more importantly, is oxymoron is not the right word. What is the right word? Paradox. Paradox. Paradoxically. There we go. Is so don't don't call worse. me an, don't call me an oxymoron again. I just Jeff. wanted we'll to call you. To, I, yeah. I see. No, but but in all seriousness, it, affordability didn't improve in your scenario necessarily because if interest rates go higher and you, stay higher, you've you got to see home prices loop. drop way more than ten percent, more than twenty, probably close to thirty percent, in actually in, in order to see an improvement in affordability. Home prices and affordability, not home prices, home payments, affordability home payments. is much more sensitive to interest rates than to prices. So everyone says, I would rather buy a home at a lower price and a higher interest rate because I'll be able to refinance at some point in the future and sure. I get the best of both worlds. Yep. If I buy at a high price, I never get a, a, to refinance my home price. That is set forever. So there's absolute logic to that, but there's an underlying premise that says there's going to be a point where you can buy at, at a lower rate. So the two components that we think can and will change that affect affordability are home prices and interest rates. And the thing that would bring home prices down is higher interest rates. And the paradox that you're talking about there, Jeb, is it would not lower payments. It would not increase affordability. So home prices could come down, but it won't increase the affordability to you. Um, and and sort of the, the conclusion of that inflation data that I was giving, interest rates are going to continue to moderate. Who knows where they, they end up leveling out at? Is it five and a half? Is it five percent? Is it four and a half? But it's definitely lower than where it is right now, which is supportive of home prices. And more importantly, the paradox you were talking about, you are going to be better served by the lower interest rates than by the lower price in terms of getting you a lower monthly payment, enabling you to afford more home or a home, period. Well, let's go the other direction. One of the rewards of waiting to buy could be lower interest rates, right? You've said inflation is going to come down or is coming down. With that, we should likely see interest rates moderate. Um, with that, that should improve affordability on a monthly payment uh, scale. Is is there a reward for seeing lower rates? I want to see lower rates. I think that's great. Um, you know, for for people looking to buy homes, for potential people looking to sell homes to buy other homes. So how does that play out? 
lower interest rates have a much, much larger impact on your monthly payment, which as you've talked about a million times, people are generally looking at their payment. They're less concerned with their interest rate and the home price than they are as, is, am I comfortable with making that payment? And I can tell you talking to buyers every day, running through numbers, that's a question that I ask as part of our pre-approval interview. How much are you paying in housing costs right now, whether it's rent, whatever it may be, and what are you comfortable with? Then we go through the numbers. Cool. You're looking for a $700,000 house. Here's what the number is in terms of a monthly payment. So interest rates will have a much bigger impact in bringing that down. So um, Jeb, sort of the next point that we have here on the list is a potential benefit of waiting would be less competition. We talked demographically. That's unlikely to, to be the case. Mm -hmm. But if interest rates come down, it moves it at the margins. Right now, I don't have the number in front of me, but I think for us here in Orange County, I think affordability is about 17%. 17% of households can afford the median home uh, to buy the median home right now. And that's a very low level. I think that's California, but, but yeah, somewhere in there. But, but mortgage rates dropping a percent, maybe it takes it up to 20%, 21%. Still, it's still historically low, but now we have 20% more buyers in the market. We have more competition. Mm -hmm. So in terms of potential benefits for waiting, the problem is they all kind of work at cross odds of, of one another. Because I think prices coming down would be dependent on rates going up. It didn't help your affordability. Rates coming down increases affordability, increases the competition. We're already at very low levels of affordability, which is why I say we don't really have a recipe for even tr on trend, which you said 4.6% for the last 60 years on trend growth. I think we're going to see three, four or five years of below trend growth. One, two, 3%. You could see a year at zero, a year at negative one, negative 2%, but it's positive growth because rates are going to come back down. We're going to have a little bit more affordability and there are enough people out there buying the few homes that are for sale because most people have record levels of nested equity, record low interest rates, and are just saying, I'm cool. I'd, I'd like to buy. I'd like to sell my house and buy something else. But when they do the math, they say, I'm cool. So again, for our audience here, who's primarily first time buyers looking to enter the market, um, those are the things that would have to happen to make a better entry point in the future. And I don't think you get multiples of those lined up where there's a significantly better entry point. There could be pieces of it that are right. better, but I don't think you're getting all of them. No. And so with that, you might see some more supply by waiting, right? So if you're in a market that has a lot of new construction being built, you know, this is a conversation, Josh, you and I were having prior to coming on here, you know. New construction is one of those com, you know, components of the housing market that, quite frankly, we don't have a lot of familiar, familiarity, familiarity. You get you get what I'm saying um, with here locally because there's not a lot of it. Right. And I don't mean there's no new construction. It's just we're not building at a pace that makes a big difference in 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 the actual supply of homes for the most part. So, you know, we get people all the time in Texas and some of these areas that have a lot of land and they're like there's houses being built everywhere. They can't sell these things. Builders are doing things to entice buyers by reducing the prices, by giving builder incentives to help unload homes. If you're in one of those markets, I think the number at the moment is somewhere around 700,000 new construction, single family homes that are due to be completed at some point between 2023 and 2024. If you're in a market that has a lot of these, you could see some more supply. And with that supply, it might it, there might be a benefit to wait, it, it's, especially if you're looking at the market now and saying, I can't find what I'm looking for. There's nothing out there. By seeing more of this inventory come to the market, by seeing new construction, if that's something you're interested in, that might be a benefit to you. But Josh, you and I talked again prior to the show. I look at the market here. We're in, we're in Huntington Beach, California, Orange County, California. And, and in Huntington Beach, we don't have a lot of new construction, but we've had a, a couple new pockets being built in field developments over the last couple of years. They tore down a school. They built, uh, you know, a housing development. They've changed uh, zoning for something. They built a, a small housing development. There's homes being built at the moment. There's two different complexes that I can think of as we're having this conversation. One, starting prices are just over $2 million. The other ones, those are single family homes on small lots, right? And I say small lots. These are three, four, three 3,500 square foot homes on 4,500 square foot lots. So the home is taking the majority of the lot. The other ones are townhome style properties that are being 
tri-level, two to three level properties with very, with no let, lot. I mean, with very little land at all, just patios and that sort of thing. And those are starting at one, three to one, four. So yes, there is new construction in some of these markets, but I ask you as a buyer, when looking at it, what is your price point? Are the homes that are being built affordable? If they are fantastic, like you're probably in the in the lower percentile, and that's great. I, I hope that it benefits you in some way. But what I'm seeing, because of the cost to build, especially here in California, hundred thousand dollars just to break ground because of all the permitting and all the the craziness that goes along with building a home, builders and the lot sizes. These builders are looking to maximize projects, and they do that by building as big of a home on as small of a lot as possible so that they can maximize the price per square foot. Therefore, yes, maybe it creates, it creates affordability if you're in that price point, if there's a surplus. But for the majority of people out there, that, that new construction I'm talking about here isn't even an option because of the price point. So Josh, when you hear that and you hear the new construction dynamic, what are your thoughts? It's a nothing here in Southern California. And the funny thing is I say that, Jeb, last night I received a purchase agreement that was for new construction. Um, I forget the exact city, but it's in the Limor area, which is Central California. Okay, Central California, we have a lot of land. A lot of farm land can be converted to housing, much more affordable housing, a $360,000 purchase price. That's mind boggling to me, new construction for $360,000 right here in California. But for a lot of the country, that's typical. So if a builder can get land reasonably cheaply, um, you know, they can build homes with a little bit of land, um, modest uh, and upgrades and improvements and still make a profit off of that. So if you're in an area where that's the case, it's different than it is for us here in, in Southern California. But 100 percent in in dense urban built out areas, you're just the supply issue is unlikely to improve because we are built out. There's a finite amount of homes. Um, I think we have less than 1% of, of single family home vacancy rate right now, meaning 99% of those homes are occupied. There aren't multiple investors with empty homes. They're either rented out or they're living in it. Um, and they have them at really low interest rates with a lot of equity in them. So they're choosing not to sell. So I don't see anything there for those of us in more urban built out areas that's going to change that. Now, if you're in uh, a Georgia, a Texas, you know, uh, a lot of the South where they're building Florida, where there's there's building and building in, in affordable price points. Um, maybe that's a different answer for you. But but for us in our areas here where we primarily do business, it doesn't really help the supply and, and nothing good really coming on the horizon to assist that. So so what should the educated home buyer who's taken 40 minutes or so <laughs> listening to this podcast do if buying is not the right time for them, Josh? You know, one of the quotes that I heard within the last year, and, and it's become one of my favorite quotes, came from Dave Ramsey, and it said, renting is buying you patience until you're ready to buy a home. And, and we've talked several, nothing wrong with renting, right? There, there's absolutely nothing wrong with renting. Renting might be part of the plan to get you to the next step. But I think it's all about having a plan, right? To start with, which is really the foundation for helping you to get to that next step. So Josh, when I say, what should people do where should they, what, what should they work on? Is there a way to get in the game if affordability is out of reach in their area? So this is, this is funny, Jeb. Um, you and I have been talking a lot recently and I've been rattling through my brain, a first time home buyer course. What do you need to know A to Z? And more importantly, what you're asking here is sort of the prerequisite or the pre-course for that. If you're not ready to buy, or even get pre-approved, what are the things that you can be working on, that anyone can be working on? Let's say you're a 22-year-old college graduate, and in your mind you say, I wanna be a homeowner. I know I'm not ready because don't know where I'm gonna be at career-wise, don't know where I'm gonna be at relationship-wise, so I am no way ready to be a homeowner, but I want to be someday. So the answer is the same for all of these people. Start with saving. We need some money. Even if you had a zero down option, we want reserves when you move into that house in case something goes wrong, in case you need to do upgrades, money for closing costs. So you want to be saving. You want to spend less than you make and have a savings and investment plan. You want to maximize and optimize your credit. 
it's actually, if you start from nothing, if you're a recent college grad, you don't really have a, a history of credit. It is not all that hard to work your way to a high 700 credit score within two to three years. If you're someone who has some dings on your credit and you're in the low sixes, high fives, not all that hard to get over a 680 in a one to two year time frame. So get to saving, work on your credit, work on your income. Jeb, like, I don't think the, one of the numbers that we, you and I talk about every week on the live show is what is wage growth uh, on the most recent numbers for job stayers versus job movers. So in the last year, people stay on the same job. They're getting five, six percent wage increases year over year. The people changing jobs are at like 10 to 14 percent. I mean, it's trending down also. Both of those numbers are trending down. But I think most people get comfortable. They're in a rut and they don't understand that there is a lack of skilled, qualified workers. If you are a good worker, you show up on time, you bust your butt. And I don't mean you're some sort of white collar, great worker. You could be a plumber, you can be a welder, you could be a contractor. Like I, as a business owner, it is hard to get good employees, people who will do their job, whatever that job is, work hard, give good customer service. So know your value. You can probably make more than what you're making right now. You can go to your employer and say, hey, I'm young. I want to buy a home. What can I do to be more valuable to this company so that I can earn more and put myself in a position to be able to own a home? Most good business owners want their employees to succeed. They will work with you uh, on that. You know, those are the big ones, Jeb. We've got a couple of other options that really are more on the real estate side, but financially putting yourself in that position. Those are the big ones that I would focus on. Get your income up, get some savings, spend less than you make and maximize, optimize your credit scores. Yeah, and there's a couple others. And these are things that typically people don't want to hear because it's not necessarily the right answer um, for many people. And, and one of them is moving to another area. Maybe if you live in Southern California, Orange County, and the median home price is a million two, and you can only afford 700,000 and you want a single family home, chances are that's not achievable in Orange County at the moment and, and not likely to be any time, you know, within the near future unless something major happens. So you might consider moving to a more affordable area to be able to get that. Maybe it's out of state. Um, maybe it's in state, but just a little bit more inland. Or perhaps you want to stay in the area that you're in. Uh, maybe you consider buying a property out of state as a rental just to get in the real estate game, be able to create a little bit of cash flow there and still continue to rent where you are. Now, I don't necessarily think that's the perfect answer, but it's an answer that gets you starting to own some real estate, gets you starting to get some of the benefits, the, the tax deductions, all of these things that real estate can allow you to do, which will ultimately lead to um, longer and greater wealth uh, down the road. So, you know, we unpacked a lot of information today. Appreciate you guys sticking around. I'm sure there's some questions around this. If you have them, do us a favor. You know, you can comment on the video here on YouTube or on the podcast. We'd be happy to have that conversation with you. Um, but we 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 definitely appreciate the support. You guys sticking with us, um, you know, to to have these conversations. It's because of you we continue to do it. And for that, we're thankful. So until next time, we're out of here. Adios. Vaya con Dios.